Every experience in our lives leads to the now moment. My guest today, Dara Brustein, is a five times business founder, author, and coach, and here to share her journey of running businesses, working with clients, and becoming a mother. Dara shares how she bridges her human experiences with her soul self, which I think makes her a perfect guest for Mystical Sisterhood. She highlights how we are all perfectly imperfect, yet unique in our divine ways. I love Dara for her realness and being a relentless advocate for us shining in our lives. Thank you, Dara, for being here, and let's dive into the episode. Welcome back to Mystical Sisterhood. This is your host, Maureen Spielman, and I'm here today with Dara Brustein. And I had the honor of meeting Dara, I would say, possibly even in 2021, maybe 22, in a beautiful business group that she had begun with her dear friend, Kate, called Mind Your Business. And it was such a clever name. And Becca Weiser, who had helped me with my website, invited me along and said, I think you might like this. And it was the most beautiful, supportive beehive of a space led by Dara and Kate and their beautiful wisdom and skills and a really bountiful experience as I was in the very beginning days of building my business. So there's so much to say, Dara, about your body of work, but I just want to say that and say, welcome to Mystical Sisterhood. Thank you. I love that introduction, but hopefully our listeners will learn. I'm such a believer in the power of connections. And you even Mm -hmm. hearkened to this privately before we started about how we never know what the seeds of those relationships might bear fruit as. And it's really fun to think back to those years ago when we met that way through a mutual connection and all the things that have happened since. Yeah, I agree. And we'll share with the listeners today what you're all about, but I'll just read a brief part of your bio from, this is from the website, but it was short and succinct. And it says, Dara is a five-time founder with one exit, author, Inc. Magazine columnist, and co-host of a digital series with Deepak Chopra. And you go on to say, I love the woo-woo stuff as much as the practical and strategic, and I'm a bit of a bridge between the spiritual and earthly. In fact, I'm a certified Reiki hypnosis and positive psychology-based practitioner. And I feel like that's such a great fit for Mystical Sisterhood. One of my guests and friends once said to me, Maureen, you marry the mainstream with the mystical. Mm. And you, Dara, will be around episode, I believe, 94. So sort of as I go, thank you, towards that completion of the second year, which you were on the ground floor of when I came to mind your business to say, I'm thinking about creating this. But I think that there's a real place today for bringing the mystical or the spiritual or the otherworldly or universal presence into our earthly experience and our human self. And so I just want to say that and thank you for being, I I think, on the vanguard because you've been about this for a while. And so if we go back a bit in terms of even Dara going to your childhood Is there anything you look back about yourself and your childhood that may have given clues to where you find yourself today? Yes, but not specifically in the spiritual sense. I will say one thing I've never really thought about is I'm a twin and there is something very mystical about sharing a womb with someone (laughs) and sharing all your resources and coming out into the world. And for, in our case, he's a boy, how different we are, that we are almost opposites in just about everything. (laughs) Really couldn't see more different, but also became business partners 15 years ago. And there's something that feels deeply spiritual about that experience, despite how, again, opposite we are, how unspiritual he would consider himself, he would probably consider himself an agnostic. Anyway, all these things to say, there's definitely seeds that I saw in these little signals early on, especially around the entrepreneurial side, As you know, I've been just said, I've started many companies and when I was little, there's two things that stick out. One is we had this little fun porch and we lived in a horse farm outside of Philadelphia and my parents would have people over to the house and I would be making pieces of jewelry out of like little beads and friendship bracelet materials (laughs) and would sell them to them. (laughs) 
I have no idea what their adult reactions were, but they would buy them. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I started doing that then where I think about my mom was a competitive bodybuilder in her mid and late forties when I was an eight year old cheerleader and our fundraiser was selling candy bars. And I would go to the gym with my mom who was she would always say she could be the mother of all of the men who worked out there. She was pretty much the only woman and she was definitely the only woman training for bodybuilding. Wow. And I would go in there with the hardest customer base of all these men who only ate eggs and meat <laughs> <laughs> would sell them these candy bars. And, you know, same thing with my brother, we would have these door to door fundraisers that we'd need to do for wrapping paper and all the things you have for school fundraisers. And he was shy as can be. So he would stand at the end of the driveway and I would take his paper and I would go up to the door and I would give my little pitch and sell the thing. And then I would switch and it would do mine. And then at the next house, I would do his and we go door to door door and would always break sales records for our grade. And back then I didn't know anything. I didn't think those things meant anything. I was just like, oh, this is my personality. But over time, I began to see that those were some of the seedlings of being interested in sales, in relationships, in business, in all of these things that have later bared so much fruit. That's beautiful. So you you seem like an also, we know you're a super connector and you mentioned that and I might want to revisit that, but did you always have a strong belief in yourself? You seem like you were able to generate ideas and know what you were interested in and follow that line of, okay, this is what I want to study and this is what I want to create. But what about your belief in yourself? I just think about, wow, your mom going and charting her own path, what a lot of people would consider late in li later in life, which is so funny because now we consider it very young, right. right? But was there something about your upbringing too or that you believed in yourself early on or was that a, a challenge for you of that self-confidence piece? I'm glad you asked because it does seem like the breadcrumbs would lead us to believe that I had a lot of self-belief when in fact I had very little. I have always felt that my biggest Achilles heel, my biggest limiting belief was around feeling enough and good enough. And there's a lot of reasons for that, particularly, and I feel like my parents will understand me sharing this publicly, but I was really raised in an environment that I think many of us in Western culture are, were raised in, and I'm an elder millennial and like my generation and adjacently of nothing is ever good enough. Like it's, it has to be the A plus, it has to be captain, it has to be president, it has to be, you know, fill in the blank. And it was all about the achievements and the accolades and the titles. And I was really good at getting on board with that. And I really fit that role really well. But I think many of us know from our own experiences that just because something looks a certain way doesn't mean it feels that same way or the way that we expect it to. And so despite me checking all of the boxes and getting all of the things that culture and my family celebrated, I felt very insecure. I felt not pretty enough. I felt not smart enough. I felt not capable enough. I felt like I couldn't figure out what my path was going to be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that had to do with I have skills that are not celebrated in those types of environments. You know, I wasn't the best athlete. I wasn't the smartest. I, you know, I wasn't the thing that was so easy to identify. Mm -hmm. I was a people person. I connected the dots for people. I curated environments. I, you know, was a great listener and supporter and advisor to people. But when you're younger, at least at that stage of life, people weren't telling me that those were skills that I could build on or that those were skills at all. And I think many of us can relate to taking for granted the things that come naturally to us, especially when they're not easily applauded. And that was definitely my case. So no, to your question, I did not <laughs> have those feelings and beliefs. And they're definitely things that I've built and worked on and have tools that have supported me in getting there over time. And I think it will be a lifelong journey. I think we're in a space where I feel like we can talk about this, but I'm a big believer that our soul chooses its journey and it comes into different ones to continue to learn and perpetuate its lessons. There's actually a great book. I'm curious if you've ever read called the soul's journey. It's mm. about a 30 year old book that goes into an immense amount of detail on this, like more than my mind can even fathom. And I found, I actually read it while my daughter, who's now eight months was a few weeks old while she would sleep on me. 
which was an amazing time to read a book about a soul choosing its adventure because <laughs> here is this little soul and you're thinking, wow, like, what are you here to learn? Are you, what are you here to teach me? All of these things. Mm-hmm. And I think about that a lot for myself of when there's things that I begrudge about the way that I was brought up or things that I begrudge about certain circumstances, I stop and I think to some degree or another, I wonder how much my soul knew that this was what I was selecting. And Mm -hmm. I couldn't perpetuate the learnings that I needed in this lifetime if it weren't for these circumstances. And it really shifts my perspective. Mm, Yeah, I really appreciate that. I don't think I've read that book. So I'd like to, but when we, when we kind of dive into what our soul is up to and what it's about. I, I think that for me, it also, it, it allows me to remove um, myself from inside and kind of take that mountaintop perspective or that witnesser, which is such a beautiful thing because I read recently when we can be in that witnesser perspective, that truly is a non-judgmental perspective. Mm-hmm. And sometimes like when we're in ourselves, like you're saying, like we get mired in our thoughts and our stories and our narratives and can't see really what it's all about. And I'm wondering, you know, when I think about my children who are now 19 to 23, sometimes there's a part of me that wants to apply the lessons I now know and understand and say, well, here, here they are for you on a silver platter and everything will be like all roses and namaste. But, but then I also understand the piece you're saying everything in perfect order and that they are here to live their lives and learn whatever lessons are on their soul journey. And I'm here to support and to be their guide or their partner or whatever it is, and being each other's teachers as one to one another. I don't think that there's a fast track to this. And you probably, I would say, I'm guessing, projecting (laughs) that you learned spiritual principles possibly earlier than I did. And yet, and still, we are here with our own experiences. Exactly. I think sometimes, you know, people when you get to a certain place in your own personal growth or evolution, we want it so much for other people. And oftentimes we can take it to a point where we're actually frustrated that they're not seeing it or they're not opening their eyes to the thing or they're not taking the lessons or noticing the patterns. But to your point, we all get there if and when it's our time to do that. And each step of it for me, like mine actually started most obviously in high school, but it started with a religious conversion. And it's interesting because I wouldn't have considered that part of my like spiritual journey in the typical sense, but really it was feeding the same needs that I had. It was feeding the seeker part of me. Like I I always joke that I'm equal parts seeker as skeptic. Like I'm (laughs) just as much devil's advocate as I am a believer in things. And there's good and bad to that. But All that to say, it started then. And while the title and the way that I practiced and learned and connected with mystical or spiritual or divine or any of these things has evolved and changed over time, there have been these signs of it and these kind of mile markers where I've gotten to pick up different things. Like, for goodness sake, I was a religious studies major in college as one of my majors because after this experience in high school, I felt really driven to understand what people's belief systems were, because I felt as someone who really deeply is curious about people and curious in general, if you can understand what someone believes in, you can understand them so much more deeply, more quickly, and at least to have a framework and a vocabulary myself for different sets of beliefs and practices and to have some respect and reverence for them, even if they weren't mine versus growing up, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia and Baltimore and, you know, we were the only Jewish family where we lived in Philadelphia were like in the middle of nowhere. And in Baltimore, we were one of four, my twin and I were two of four Jewish kids at a 2000 person public high school. So we were othered in that way, but pretty much everyone was Catholic and Christian. So I didn't know people from all these other faith backgrounds. And so coming into university and going and being a practitioner of these things as part of my studies, going to monasteries and going and trying different forms of meditation and hearing all these things and reading old texts from different things. Like it wasn't because I was necessarily trying to embrace them myself for my own practice, but Mm -hmm. it was also interesting because it showed me the interconnectedness of so much of this, which instead of what we often like to do in our culture and other people and separate, it showed me how similar we actually are Mm -hmm. and what we're all seeking fundamentally is so similar. Not obviously I'm making generalizations, but I think you get where I'm going. 
I do. And I believe that certain people like yourself are here as leaders, you know, most of the times, maybe the header someone would put on you as a, a business leader, a business coach, but I love them that marrying of the spirituality, but that leadership, because when you say that it reminds me of unity consciousness. And that idea, that's probably where we all came from. And that's definitely where we're headed. And we need leaders who exemplify that the unity consciousness is here for all of us. That's what comes to mind when you share that. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah. Well, we know that our relationships are one of the biggest teachers in our lives. And then I was thinking, just reading your bio and how many businesses, Dara, that you did start when you were a younger woman. And wondering what have your businesses, if that's a good direction to go, taught you about life? It's, you know, we think like a relationship with something has to be with a person, but it can also be with a thing like a business. Oh yeah. <laughs> so. I think your circumstances are to the point you're making these mirrors for you to help you learn. And one of the things I say to a lot of my coaching clients who are either executives or they're running their business themselves because it's their company is that their business, maybe short of being a parent or a marriage or something along those lines, is probably and will likely be the biggest crucible for their growth and learning. And that has far and away been for me too. And, you know, sometimes I laugh when certain circumstances come up because I'm like, oh, there's that lesson again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'll be annoyed by it and be like, oh, shoot. <laughs> like right. Right. There's something to that. So yeah, they all really have. The first business is a good example of this. It's the one I started with my twin brother in 2009, and it's a credit card processing company. So if we think back historically to what 2009 was, yeah. it's when the global, <clears throat> sorry, my voice, it's when the global financial markets were falling apart. Yeah. So to say, hey, I'm 25 years old and I want to start a financial services company when the global economy is in shreds. That sounds very strange. Yet there we were. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it was a company that I can, in retrospect, paint a beautiful picture for. I can say, and we still run it. We run it possibly now 15 years later, but I could paint the picture of, and it's the easy sound bite. We grew this company from zero to into 38 states. It's something we run with passive revenue now. we spend maybe 1% of our time with no hyperbole on it and still make a significant amount of income off of it. It opened my eyes to meeting so many business owners because almost every business takes a credit card payment and you get to get under the hood of so many businesses and support them in this fundamental part of how they make money in their business. And all that is true. What that also doesn't account for is the really hard shit that we experienced where we had the easiest way to encapsulate it without going into too much detail, two embezzlements, where we almost went back to zero both times, where you know our parents were telling us, you guys should quit. I don't believe that you can do this. Mm -hmm. Where my self-doubt was in total shambles, where you know we had angry merchants calling us because they're getting screwed by these processors that we're pairing them with, because at the end of the day, it's an industry where we have no control over the end service that we're providing. And despite being someone where my word means absolutely everything to me, that I couldn't always control that what I said and what outcomes happened were in unison. That was a really stressful and strenuous experience where a lot of my insecurities played out in the way that I showed up where, you know, we had 24 seven support for our customers. That was not us. Yet I would get literal 2 a.m. phone calls from nightclub owners that were my customers and I would answer them on a Tuesday night because they needed something instead of putting up a boundary and saying, hey, here's where you can get that support that you need that actually has the answer. Instead, I was so afraid of losing the business, so afraid of not being liked, so afraid of my reputation being sullied that I made all these ridiculous decisions and it made me start running this business that was actually running me when in fact I wanted the freedom and flexibility that a business can afford you. Mm -hmm. And did that leave you exhausted? One million percent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was very exhausted. And I, despite trying to show the world, meaning our customers and our referral partners and our family that we believed in this and we could do it. I had nothing but doubt and self, yeah. you know, second guessing. So there was a lot going on there. Yeah. Sounds like a really busy, but then a very soul searching time, which maybe you didn't realize you were soul searching, but did it, did you emerge from that with a, a bigger knowing of what it would take to, or what you wanted to pull in when you began your next adventure? 
<laughs> yeah. So as we were running it, I started my next two things. And the thing that I've come to find for myself is that one, I like to help solve problems that I think that I have the bandwidth, the skills, the fill in the blanks to actually make some sort of impact on. And two, that typically these things show up at my doorstep and I'm not just pulling them out of nowhere. So those second and third things were one, a financial literacy education book series for children. And the third being a networking events company for young professionals. And they were both born out of challenges, like watching the global markets collapse and having people say, well, we never got financial education. We don't even know. And now we're perpetuating bad behaviors and bad belief systems around money to our gener next generations. And I'm thinking, oh, that's so interesting because I was raised in an environment, little did I know was unique, where my parents bore into our minds financial literacy. They had us investing in the stock market in middle school. They had us learning about compound interest in early high school. All of these things that I just thought were common and they were not. And they also just taught us the basics of like the value of a dollar and not spending more than you have and, you know, all of these types of things. And so that really made me notice that thing and say, well, how could I help? And it had me recognizing, well, I have, I like to write and I'm pretty good at it. And so I just put the things together thinking this is a mechanism by which young people are already learning and that it doesn't put the caregiver in the position of having to be the expert. So that was one thing I just sort of started to notice. And then with the networking events company, I had a friend from college move back to Atlanta where I am from law school. And she said, I don't know where to go to make friends after college. Everyone that I know or every place that I go to, I'm either getting hit on, sold to, everyone's my parents' age, or they're all in my industry. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest? And I was like, well, that place doesn't exist. I'm really immersed in the networking community here. Let me just start it for you. Mm -hmm. Having no idea that would turn into a 30,000 person business, meaning that was our customer count. And something that I sold 11 years later, which was ironic again, during a global mm -hmm. pandemic where no one was meeting in person, it's an in-person events company. And so I think some of that was taking the lessons like you're alluding to from that first company. And it gave me the confidence and cut my teeth enough to say, okay, I know enough about what I want and what I don't want and what works and what doesn't. And some of those things, meaning I just had the confidence enough to step out on my own and do something independently. I needed my brother the first time mm -hmm. that I knew I wanted to have ownership over the actual outcome that we gave to our customers. That really mattered to me and so many other parts of it. But, and I think also too, just that openness, like if we're going to go back to the spiritual side of having that openness and cognizance of what's showing up. There's that old fable and I'm going to bludgeon it, but something along the lines of someone's trapped on an island and they're asking for a boat to come and get them. And they're like, send me a red boat. And suddenly they see this tricycle or they see this rowboat or they see the this. And they're like, no, where is that power boat that I asked for? And, you know, God or divine or universe is like, what are you talking about? Like, I have been sending you all these things. And just because it's not exactly the way that you said, doesn't mean that. I haven't mm -hmm. given you the solution or given you the thing and to be paying enough attention for these cues and signals around you to say like, mm, there's something there and to sort of feel it in your body. Does it feel expensive? Does it feel like there's possibility or opportunity and to not have to make some major, because I, I see this a lot with my clients that they often fear having to make this huge determining choice or mm -hmm. that they fear having to jump off a ledge or they fear having to brand themselves with something or publicly commit to something. You don't have to do any of those things. You just have to follow the breadcrumbs and take one step at a time and feel like, oh, is there something to uncover here? Is there something of interest? So when I started the networking events company, for example, I didn't say this is going to be a company. It said, let me throw an event. And then people wanted another event. Okay. So I threw another event and then I was like, I should probably incorporate this. And so it just sort of snowballed. And I think that life is often giving us those signals. We just have to pay attention and to steward them appropriately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then- is there also for even yourself or the modern day solopreneur entrepreneur, is there, where does discernment come in? And I, you just mentioned like, what is the feeling in your body? And I know you talk yes. a lot about intuition. What is there to offer around all of this? Because in today's landscape, when you describe your experience, you said you had a couple of things going on, like the right in the financial books and then the networking company. But I also can envision you as this is what Dara is doing now. And it doesn't feel like you had your hands in a couple of places, but it doesn't feel, it still feels like it's focused to me. And yeah. in today's culture, there's such a, oh, here's 
50 things you can do. And I, right. I can speak for myself. It's, oh, the wash over of how that feels. And is that, yeah, I, I'll, I'll let you take that, but. Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk to both sides of this, the like tactical and strategic side and the discernment side. So if I forget to come back to discernment, please bring me back. <laughs> the, okay. So the first part of it is so important that I'm not a fan personally of starting multiple things at the same time, because to your point, the focus is really scattered and scattered energy and focus equals scattered results. So what I have been a fan of is getting something to a point where it is systemized enough that I have seen and tested and sort of battle tested how effective that company can run without me being in the focus of it and my energy is being directed at it as my primary thing. So I was in the credit card processing company for about seven or eight years before the next thing happened. Yeah. And then I got that to a point where it could, the second thing where it could self-operate enough after a couple of years. And then, and you know what I'm saying? Like, so each thing I sort of either built the team and or built the processes and the standard operating procedures and automated and delegated and hired and did the things. And it doesn't mean zero focus went to those things from then on out, but I made determinations around one, like, do I want this thing to be stable and plateau? Do I want it to grow? Am I okay for it to shrink? And to be clear about what that expectation and intention was, and then pair my actions with those things. And it doesn't mean that my actions and the intentions always made the results that I had hoped for, but that was a really important first step rather than what I think a lot of people think is, oh, well, you ran and you run all these things. Therefore, I can go start 17 things at the same time. And I'm going to see all of this efficacy and get all the outcomes that I'm looking for. I don't believe that that is generally the case. And yes, I'm sure that there are outliers. There's always a bell curve here, but most of us are going to fall in the place where that's not going to be our best choice. The second part of the discernment question is essential that you and I could take the exact same actions, but the intention we have behind them and our knowing if it really feels aligned and best for us and whatever else is capital T true for us might be totally different. And the only distinction between that is our own discernment and our own self-knowing and self-trust. And that's some muscle. And it's not something that I think just you have or you don't have. I think it's an ongoing practice where mm -hmm. we need to be investing in whatever the things are that help us stay connected to self. And for many people, that's meditation. For other people, it's being in nature and doing whatever they might be doing in nature. For others, it's being with certain people in certain places or having support like therapists or coaches or mentors where they can verbally process or great friends who are on a similar wavelength. And sometimes it's a combination of many things. And often it's also tied to things we don't accredit this things to, which is something that my clients are often surprised we do in our work, which is getting down to the brass tacks of what are your baseline things? Meaning what is your nutrition like? What is your hydration like? What is your sleep like? What is your movement like? And how are you, what are your energy levels like? Because if all those things are off, then we're going to be expending a lot of cognitive power and physical energy that's getting in the way of our self-knowing. And when we think of ourselves as, when I work with executives, I often liken them to high-performance athletes where it can be these 1% incremental shifts that make the world a difference of, you know, if an athlete doesn't rest and recover after a big match or a game, and they just go on to the next thing into the next workout, they're actually doing themselves a disservice. And that's no different here. And so when we're not fueling ourselves and resting and doing the things that allow us to feel our best, we can't actually hear ourselves. Mm -hmm. The other piece of that too is, I think this can be really confuddling and confounding for people because we all quote hear differently. And in the spiritual world, there's the five, what are they called? Um, you know what I'm talking about? Sentiences, like the mm -hmm. oh, audio, like Claire sent the, the Claire's yes, like, yes. do you hear, mm -hmm. do you see, do you feel, do you whatever? And like, I have a friend who she just hears the word of divine very clearly in her prayers and meditations. I'm not that person. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I'm more, you know, I can kind of feel in my body. Does it feel expansive or does not, but I have to slow down and actually stop for that or write and sort of get the space for it. Whereas for other people, they just might know in an instant, it's just really obvious. And so mm -hmm. I just want to suggest to people that there isn't one way to do it. And it might even look different ways in different parts of your life. But when we aren't allowing ourselves the space for that, 
that's typically when we start moving down pathways where the lessons start hitting us over the head really hard and harder and harder until we are actually listening. And yeah. ideally we don't get to that place because that's mm-hmm. when things often derail so that you will start paying attention. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think about, you know, even my husband's work and he's in the financial industry and I can see that some work is very stressful and that it almost feels like if someone is going to suggest something that's around self-care or think about this, then it feels too much. And that's kind of ironic, right? Because it's the thing that's going to, yes. to assist you in your work. Yet it makes perfect sense that most of us were not brought up to take care of ourselves in these ways. So it can seem like the lowest hanging fruit or the simplest stuff, but really it's learning a new language and learning to integrate. So do you sometimes go a little slowly or how do you do that with your clients? It depends. I mean, everything is Mm -hmm. so bespoke to the person and what they need. And one of the most common retorts I get from busy entrepreneurs and executives is what you're alluding to of, well, I'm too busy to do those things. And it's very much that challenge of urgent over important. And Mm -hmm. I am not a believer in busy or can't. It's just a matter of priority. And yeah, there's certain things that we prioritize that maybe aren't even the things that we'd prefer to do, Mm -hmm. but you know, you're, there's still a priority. And so where can we fit that in? And so this is where I also am a big believer in integration over balance, where it's not a this or a that it's how do I integrate the things that matter to me? And so in this stage of my life with an infant, when I have, you know, a specific amount of time without childcare where I don't, you know, my, I want my focus to be with my child and my partner when we are together is to say, okay, great. Like who's coming to Pilates with me, friends? Like, let's do those two things at the same time because I want to get my movement in and I want to see you right. and, mm-hmm. you know, or, Hey, I can't do that. Like I'm not choosing to do that thing in person, but I'd still love to catch up on FaceTime or when I'm on my walk or Mm -hmm. whatever those things are. But instead of being like, I can't or whatever, it's, I'm just, I'm choosing not to. And Mm -hmm. I'm prioritizing what feels most important to me based on what I value in this season. Yes. Yeah. I like the choice point, the choice, the choice is yours. And it feels like in a lot of different situations, definitely when we have children, a newborn, you know, a toddler, it's our nervous system can become flooded oftentimes for many. So I like the way you're describing, like I go on a walk today when we're recording Maureen, do you care if I have my camera off? They're like, they're very self-care. They're like little things, but they're really self-care taking. And yes, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. Well, Um, let me add one thing to that, which is It can feel intimidating to ask for or say the thing that you actually want to need, especially because many of us are people pleasers or were once people pleasers. And there's so much that can be lost in translation. And so it's really easy for someone to misinterpret. And, you know, one of my biggest triggers is being misunderstood. And when you do any of these things and you assert your boundaries, even in the kindest of ways, like me saying to you yesterday, hey, we can do this if I need to be off camera because I'm going to be ready to leave after to go work out and I'm not going to be camera ready. That took some bravery for me to say that. And I really respected and appreciated your understanding around that. Because there's also people who have been like, sorry, it doesn't work like that. And Mm -hmm. then I would have just had to been okay with that outcome of great, then we won't record. But also being okay with, well, that person might have been disappointed in me or whatever that might look like. So I think a lot of it just comes down to being really honest with ourselves and saying, would I rather disappoint myself or would I rather disappoint someone else? And even if I don't mean to, because obviously my intention is to not go around hurting or disappointing people, but to do my best without over-indexing on explanation, but to just be as clear and kind as possible. Absolutely. I believe like it's, I had another interaction this week or an interaction where a woman was clear on her boundary with me. And, you know, I had a, I had a choice and I've been kind of taking a different view of things like with that spiritual concept of there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. And if I would have received this request from you, like Maureen, this works, this is what I would like to do with that work for you. I can step away from it and say, anything that tells me that, and it it could be that it wouldn't work for me. Right. But I like to look at the big, bigger picture and say, is there a part of this situation that you're 
saying is right or wrong, or it needs to be this way, because you might be going off some conditioning or like a set of rules that are like out there in the ethers. And I, I just try to step away from that and see it as like perfect, beautiful. That's what it's meant to be. And again, choice points in there, right? But really the pause and the backup and the the reflection of what works for me. And I, I love the I love when it's between two females because then we get the proof. We get, maybe we were conditioned to believe that it couldn't be so smooth, but we prove to ourselves like, oh, look, I just asked for what I needed and she listened to me. And that's just a, it's a powerful relationship to have to be seen like that. Absolutely. I also like to do what you do when you're in that opposite seat where someone has expressed their need or their desire to try my best to step back, even if I don't want or like what they're asking for and at least give them credit and say like, this is a great example of someone doing this Mm -hmm. and showing me that there's permission to do this. Absolutely. That's why I love the just mystical sisterhood and listening to the voices of, you know, it's been mostly women so far for sure. And my friend Joe has been on a couple (laughs) of times and I'm, you know, that I think that's, like I just got my first mail request for my, you know, private group, the Facebook group. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to sit back and think about this. But I think being in community, um, really seeing each other. And I have to say, let's practice the skills. Let's practice. And even sometimes if we're naming, if we feel safe enough to name name that I, you're practicing or I'm practicing, whatever right. it is, it's it, it's powerful because we truly are all learning together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This goes back to that interconnectedness that when done thoughtfully, like we're all on this journey together, supporting each other, learning together, growing together. Yes, for sure. And as you know, we've talked about a lot of things, but you know, I think of you, Dara, as a new mother and just see your beautiful pictures and your smile and, you know, everything that's coming through it. And I think because I had studied with Dr. Shafali in the Conscious Parenting Institute, There's a part of me that says, you know, with so much compassion, oh, I wished I would have known these tools when I was a young mother. I was definitely craving something because I knew intuitively that I didn't want to do it like my parents did it because that was too much discipline and that was not enough of a place for my voice. Mm -hmm. And, but I had no tools. And so I can look back with so much compassion at the messiness and this beautiful, hurt young mother I really was. But I think that it's easy for me to say like, oh, Dara's got it all figured out. She went into motherhood with her spiritual foundation and all the things. But what do you know about that? I would imagine it's incredibly helpful and still mothering is a very big role. There's so much I can say on this, (laughs) starting from the place of, and you probably know this, I truly never thought I wanted to be a mom. And so there was a major spiritual journey for me alone on coming to the decision to try to get pregnant and then moving through the challenges of getting pregnant and questioning like this all worth it and also being in a partnership where on our first date he said to me my biggest dream is to be a dad and I said Mm -hmm. you probably shouldn't date me Mm -hmm. (laughs) and yet we like continued to navigate with grace this partnership until we came to the same place and now I often say to him that was a great idea (laughs) <laughs> but I didn't see that at all. And a lot had to do with outdated identities and so much fear that was wrapped around it that I needed to work through. And so when I found out I was pregnant, the first thing I did was cried because I was scared. And then the second thing I did was looked at my stomach and said, I guess you have some things to teach me. <laughs> and I think that's been the lens from which Brendan, my partner and I have both wanted to approach this as best as possible, knowing we will be humans who want to assert assert our ways on our child. But we want as best as possible to come from this perspective of you are this soul who has so much innate knowledge and spiritual being and like all of these things that we want her to also show us how she should be parented and how she, who she is in this world and give her space for that while also knowing this is a human experience and she's going to need certain protections and guardrails and this and that. And so going into it, I'd imagine most parents go in feeling pretty ill-equipped. We both felt completely at ground zero, if not negative, because we had zero experience with babies. You know, on the one hand, I felt like we had all these spiritual tools. On the other hand, we had no practical tools. (laughs) 
But I did have enough tools as a human to say like, Brendan and I talk about this a lot, that Brendan was 46 when we had her and I was 40 when we had her. Mm -hmm. And in today's world, that's not old, but it's definitely older parents. And I'm so grateful that it worked out this way because if we had done it earlier stages in our life or earlier stages in our relationship, we wouldn't have known ourselves as well. We wouldn't have known each other as well. We wouldn't have had the stability of our relationship, the financial resources, and the clarity of our values of how we wanted to spend our time and resources around this. Like we heavily invest in support in this experience in our home and with her so that the time we are with her, we feel like we can really be focused and intentional and enjoying as much as we can rather than stressing about all the logistics and the details and the dishes and the yeah. laundry and the, all of those things that so many people had told me, oh, the stage is going to be miserable. You're not going to sleep, this, this, that, and the other. And so we thought, why don't we set ourselves up for success in the way that we define that? Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, all of the, our learnings and life experience and spiritual lessons have brought us to a place. And we also realized, as everyone who's had a child knows, everything is constantly changing. And so there's even this macro spiritual lesson of impermanence. Mm -hmm. And every time something shifts, it feels a little jarring and scary because you're like, oh, I feel like we just got a rhythm down and yes. now we need to learn new things and the stakes feel mm -hmm. high as they can be because mm -hmm. this is an innocent life that doesn't have a lot of ability to care for themselves or none. So all that to say, I think it continues to push me in a lot of my learnings yeah. and a lot of my own development. And I don't fool myself to think that I know any better than anyone else does, but I will say that I know enough to not let all the voices and the noise in. I think I might've done an earlier stage because I would have been crowdsourcing my parenting as yeah. opposed to now where I do have the strength of self enough to trust myself and mm -hmm. to bring in trusted, respected counsel yeah. of different people who I do want that from, but to still always put it through the sieve of my own intuition and of ourselves mm -hmm. as a couple, yeah. which I do across the board, but I've been given 10 decades or 10 decades, four decades of, <laughs> I'm a hundred, of <laughs> experience of learning how to take in information and how to show up in the world and mm -hmm. can apply it here too. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I'm just thinking about too, when a little one comes into the world and when we look at the things that we struggled with and when those themes of not feeling worthy or not feeling enough, I believe knowing those sort of themes and just thinking about a baby's attachment and just there, it's the presencing, it's the attuning to their energy. But like you're saying, is there, she's little, so you don't have boundaries so much yet, but there's also the self-care that for you and your partner that is being called for. And I've seen you when you can, I think you got away on your own and that that's not selfish. That's refilling you. So you can go back as the holist mother that you can be. Exactly. I think there's mm -hmm. so many narratives that pressure parents, especially mothers, to give everything to their family. And mm -hmm. I choose differently. I choose to give everything to the thing that I am focused on mm -hmm. and to make sure that when I am not doing the other thing that it is well cared for. So whether that's to my daughter, whether that's my partner, whether that's my businesses, my clients, that I don't want to leave anything in a lurch and I want there to be seamlessness. It kind of goes back to the lessons we talked about with starting different companies at different times. I don't want to step out of my primary focus into something else and have that be felt. And with our nanny, for example, she absolutely adores her and vice versa. Like our daughter and they have such a bond that it almost feels like they knew each other in a past life and our nanny has remarked that it felt like they'd known each other. And <laughs> that feels great to feel great. She's in this love relationship when we're not there. And also, you know, something you know about me is I'm a big believer in designing one's business to be the vehicle that creates the time and financial freedom yeah. for the life that you want mm -hmm. and to not have your business be the thing that dictates that you have very little time and space left for what you value and how you want to spend your time outside of work. Mm -hmm. And that's because I, I did that the wrong way the first time. And this is no different where, you know, I structured my life to work from home and I structured my life to be able to pop in during the day and see her. And it's again, that integration piece rather than it's either this or that. Mm. And all the while, I just feel like that self-care for yourself and what you need in the moment. So you can show up in the spaces the best you can. 
I appreciate it, Dara. And as we kind of circle to the end, is there anything that we didn't cover in this short space of that you would want to share with the listeners or anything on your mind? And if you feel complete, that's good too. The thing that's coming up is just this idea of comparison that it's probably really common to listen to something like this and feel like we just have it figured out or that we're further along on some fake path or anything like that. And I'll speak for myself and you can speak for yourself too, that I don't want anyone to walk away from this feeling at all dejected or like, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I'm not there wherever there is, or look how far ahead they are. I can't get there. It's none of those things. Like, I feel like my journey, especially with like connectivity to spirituality feels so different at different times, or sometimes it feels more connected other times less. But I also realize that it's always there. It just might show up differently or it might be a different stage or season that I need things to look a certain way. Like there's times where I've been in spaces and in relationships with friends or professional colleagues where it's been like so overtly quote spiritual and other times where it's not. But part of the spiritual experience, I believe, is meandering through these different parts, because as we've heard a million times, we are you know, spiritual beings having a human experience that the human experience part is a real part of it. And that's okay too. And to not feel sidewinded or downtrodden at all, if you don't feel like you have some active connection to it, like your life is a spiritual experience, period. Like you are connected to it regardless. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And that, and that, that human experience part of it oftentimes on many days can just become really big for so many of us. So I, I agree with you that take the pieces of the conversation that work for you and literally are working for you that are there for you to take into your heart and that have spoken to you and leave what is not for you and that we are all in this human experience together. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Dara, if you'd like to share where the listener can find you, that would be wonderful. I think there might be a few places. Yeah, the best two are my website, which is dara.co, so D-A-R-R-A-H.co, or Instagram, which is Dara B, so D-A-R-R-A-H-B. Yeah, and I, I love, I would encourage you to go look at Dara's Instagram. I You have just such a natural way of being on that channel, and you really bring the, I think, the wisdom and the ideas and the practical information through what you're doing in such a natural way. So thanks for being a great model there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Transparently, I'm such a late adopter to most technologies, including Instagram. And so I went yeah. into it years ago, very begrudgingly. And over time, you know, I think I did what a lot of people do, which is I tried to initially model what I saw working. Mm -hmm. And then that started to feel misaligned and just began to say what actually feels like a true representation that of me and how I show up outside of this space, but also equally importantly, serves the people who are giving me the precious gift of their attention to mm -hmm. pay attention mm -hmm. here. You know, it's a work yeah. in progress always, but I appreciate well, that feedback. Yeah. And you're one of the emails that I almost always open. So get on Thank the email you. list too. But okay. Thanks, Dara, for being here. And thanks for the listener for being here. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to this episode of Mystical Sisterhood. To learn more about my one-on-one -on -one coaching programs or join the Mystical Sisterhood membership, visit MaureenSpielman.com or MysticalSisterhood.com. Thanks so much. I'll see you in the next episode.